welcome everybody. A uh, beautiful sunny day here in Calgary. And uh, I don't know where people are joining us from, but you are very welcome. And I'd like to begin with the traditional land acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Bikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tsutsina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and it is with great gratitude that uh, we join you here today in this beautiful place. And next slide, Michelle, there we go. Uh, this is Nickel at Noon, the online edition. We've been online si since September. It's gone pretty well. Um, <laughs> and if you're returning, um, welcome. And if you're new to this program, I'm so glad that you're able to join us. We offer different programs throughout the, uh, the fall and winter terms. Um, and we're free every Thursday from 12 to 1. If you've joined us today, it's the same codes for next time. Uh, and uh, in fact, we've got programs running until the uh, 22nd of April. So every Thursday, you can join us here. Full program de details are on our website. You're welcome to follow us on, on um, your favorite social media platform if you've got one. Uh, like us, like us, like us, share us, share us. Subscribe to our mailing list if you'd like the uh, notices into your uh, email inbox. Just reach out to Marla or myself. We're gonna ask for the duration of the, of the presentation that you keep your microphones on mute and we'll hold all the chat questions and comments until the end. I think that this has worked out a little bit better. We can make sure that we um, get to as many questions as possible without disruption to the speaker. Please be aware that we're recording this presentation and once it's cleaned up, it will be added to the Nichols YouTube channel. I think Marla's put the, um, uh, put the link in the uh, in the chat bar already. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, there's some fantastic talks there. Uh, and uh, I've got a couple, a couple of new ones to post. I'll get that up really soon. Participant names and the chat are not included in that recording. However, if you speak, your voice, not your face, but your voice will be included in the recording. Um, and that's worked out pretty well. I think they're, uh, they're actually really engaging uh, uh, recordings. My name is Michelle Hardy. I'm a curator with Nickel Galleries and your host today. Marla Halstead is there. There she is waving. Thank you, Marla. She's our front end manager and technical guru. Next week, FYI, I'm really pleased to, uh, to announce that Aaron's, Dr. Aaron Sutherland will be joining us. Aaron is the new uh, Associate Professor of Indigenous Heritage at the University of Calgary. Um, she has just joined the uh, Department of Art and will be teaching Museum and Heritage Studies courses as well as Art History courses. Super pumped to, uh, to offer Erin her first public platform at the University of Calgary. So please come back for that talk. But today's main event is Caitlin Thompson. Uh, and her talk is called Embroidermation. I've had to practice that word, Embroidermation, Stitches to Pixels. And just a few words about Caitlin. She grew up in rural um, East Central Alberta and completed a BFA in sculpture, first at the Red Deer College, and then she moved to the Alberta College of Art and Design. Sorry, new name, University of... Oh, crap, I forgot. Alberta that. University. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> Don't change your name. <laughs> so she finished that in 2007 and then moved to Montreal to uh, pursue an MFA in fiber and material practices at Concordia University, finishing her degree in 2015. Uh, following graduation, she came back to Alberta, completing, as she says, a beneficial cycle of journeying and returning. While maintaining her current studio practice, Caitlin also works as an art, arts educator and gallery preparator. She actually works for Esker and Glenbow, um, has some wonderful programs coming up, which my 
teenage son is really looking forward to. In this presentation, Caitlin will focus on a recent exhibition, uh, Panor Amada, sharing her research into embroidermation, which is the combination of embroidery and animation. Both these processes rely on sequential bits of information, stitches and pixels, and provoke similar feelings in the viewer. Her research investigates the relationships between them as well as their histories and techniques. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here. Caitlin, I've been so excited to hear you speak and I will, there we go. We're ready right. to share your screen. Well, thanks so much, Michelle and Marla for facilitating this and everybody for joining in. Uh, so I'm sort of structuring this as part kind of virtual studio tour through my processes and as well as giving examples of other artists who work with the combination of animation and embroidery. Let's just, all right. So what we're looking at here is one of my pieces from the uh, Panoramata series. And it's quite a large piece. It's a it's probably around four, four by six feet. Um, and it's made from both applique and embroidery and then digital cutout 2D animation um, looped over top of it to create the animated sequence. So how I came about this was I had previously been working in both textiles and animation separately before going to grad school. Um, I was really attracted to working with materials and then translating that into um, very highly detailed drawings and animations. And I, when I started to work between these things, they kind of realized that they felt very similar, the act of embroidery and the act of animation. Um, not only do they both take, you know, long periods of time to work through, but also you kind of have the same physical experience of, of making these things come to life from inanimate objects. So these are two of the older works I did prior to entering grad school um, into the fibers and material practices program at Concordia. And this was the first embroidermation that I made. And I hadn't really been looking at any examples or other artists who had been working this way before. It just sort of, I just sort of kind of came about doing it. And in order for something to appear animated, it has to appear to be alive and it has to appear to be alive through movement. So for something to appear alive, kind of has to have a risk of also dying. And for something to keep moving, it has to have this um, self-propulsion or reborn kind of aspect to it. So I really started looking at animated loops um, as a way to really think about how an animation can move and how it can um, sort of broadcast the idea that it's alive. So a lot of the imagery that I use are things like flowers blooming and dying, um, you know, creatures moving around, those sorts of uh, classic animation subject matter that um, is found in the industry. So that previous animation was, um, the stitch work is taken off of the cuff of this piece here. Um, that's a sculptural standalone piece. And I was at the time really attracted to country Western embroidery as this um, site where I could talk about craft, I could talk about fashion, I could talk about performance and identity. And I started to think about fashion and textiles being this art of transforming. It gives people, you know, clothing is a barrier um, between how people see you and how you feel. So I was really interested in um, exploring that kind of, those kind of um, subject matter in this work. So a lot of my work tends to be kind of this natural meets the unnatural, um, existing in a space 
between plant and animal, between animate and inanimate. And I really wanted, I really gravitated towards combining these two because I felt like I wanted to have my textile pieces exist in another space and to live on, in another dimension. And when something is a looping animation, it's kind of like it just takes care of itself. I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't have to worry about giving this character something to do. It just keeps regenerating itself. And for my thesis at um, Concordia, I worked uh, on a large project called Dandelions. It's actually up in Harcourt House in Edmonton right now. But these are some of the embroidermations from that work. And here I was really thinking about how can I use animation as a design for ornamentation? So these are examples of some of the stitch work. Um, it's a combination of machine embroidery, hand embroidery, and uh, sequins and rhinestones. And so all of these designs are just two images. So either they're flipped back and forth between themselves or rotated around, um, just really studying very simple techniques of how to make an animated, um, how to make an image animated. So I kind of worked backwards. I started out by making four and a half minute kind of narrative animated short films and worked backwards from there, studying very, very simple techniques in order to achieve an embroidermation. So this was one of the very first embroidermations that I ever saw, um, 2014, I believe it won like a, a best video feature on, on Vimeo, the online um, platform. And this is a piece, uh, it's, it's made as a music video by Nikos Livesley and Tom Bunker from Blink Inc. Studios. Uh, I believe they're in the UK. And this is a very kind of classic cell animation, one picture after another after another. So these are machine embroidered um, frames from an animation. There's 3000 of them and they are embroidered on pieces of denim material. And so what I saw in this um, is interesting because the textile industry and the animation industry share a very similar trajectory of labor um, historically, oper under, operating under a head designer or a director. And then with most of the in-between work, um, either the piece work in textiles or the, the actual animating of the frames performed by a large number of most of the time undercredited workers, you know, it tends to be the designer or the director that take credit for the, for the design of the film, but the labor intensity involves many, many people. So in order to embroider 3000 frames, you have quite a large team from this blinking studios, I would guess probably anywhere between 15 or 20 people working for months at a time to make this happen. So both industries rely on a human and machine relationships. And both animation and um, textiles tend to be very fast um, industries, but countering that is the absolute slow speed that it takes to, for the physical act of embroidering and animating. So I'm just gonna show you a clip of um, Tharsis Sleeps here. So it's a, it's a heavy metal um, band thrown from the UK. So um, they were making some relationships between the material and, and the music. Um, all of the embroidery is done on denim, which were then turned into patches that you could sew onto your jackets and um, sold as kind of a fundraiser for the project that way. And uh, another artist that I'm very, very fascinated with is Nina Paley. And Nina Paley is from, I believe she's from Indiana. And she's mostly known as a feature film animator. Um, 
she probably her most famous work is Sita Sings the Bloom, the Sita Sings the Blues, which is an animated feature film, but she also works um, with her partner Theodore Gray in what they call Pale Gray Labs, which is a, um, a lab where they have six or seven of these large scale machines and also these old antique uh, sewing machines that you can see her working there on. And um, they explore the relationships of embroidery and animation. She's the one where I first heard the word, the actual word embroidermation from. And uh, when they define embroidermation, they, they say, quote, something so obviously more work than it's worth. Um, which is, you know, I, I always like the slightly self-deprecating humor that animators tend to have about their working practices. So in this film that they made, they actually use stitch coding to translate all the muscles and articulations of, of the animals in their embroidery. So as you can see here, you have the sort of structural skeletal element of the design and then the animation following that contour to contour. Um, highly detailed work. Generally, when you have an embroidery machine, there's sort of like a default setting you can choose to make it stitch something. And that's generally very flat looking. So Tharsis Sleeps was a little bit more like that. Everything had one texture to it. So I'm just going to show you a, um, a snippet of Hadgadya, which is the um, animation she did of a Jewish Passover song. <laughs> So um, this is about 700 frames of animation on these pieces of fabric, which she then sewed into matzah covers um, for, for Passover. Um, so I really, I, I love how she thinks about her work because she really matches the style of the animation with the style of the subject matter. So uh, Hadgad Yav, as, as I don't speak Yiddish, but as far as I've been told, it's kind of a cyclical song, sort of similar to um, like the old lady who swallowed a fly or something. So it, it kind of keeps flipping back over on itself. So by using this technique of this circular style of animation, she's relating the material to the subject matter. She also has a project called the Quilt Vault. Um, her studio, I believe, is in, in an old bank and they have a vault in the basement, um, which they've turned into a guest bedroom with the quilts that they design. So this is a study of the Edward Moybridge uh, running horse, which was one of the first um, animated sequences at the turn of the century um, to study the movement of a horse because prior to that, there was sort of an idea that a horse always had one foot on the ground while it was running. So, but and when the advent of film happened, they could slow that down and discover exactly how things moved in motion. So this is all done on a very large scale quilting machine um, in a technique she likes, she likes to call traplique or applique combined with um, trapunto, which is like a very sort of bubbly textured style of quilting. So, this is probably one of the first um, animated GIFs of an embroidermation that I saw. And it, it really inspired me because prior to this, I always felt really disheartened by the disconnect between making an animation and having people view it. You know, you could spend months working on something that someone might spend 25 seconds looking at and then once you've seen it, you've seen it, and you never really get to look at it again. So an animated GIF is just a really pleasurable way to 
spend a lot of time with, with the animation. Another artist I was looking at at the time was Aubrey Longley Cook, who I believe is from Atlanta. And uh, he works primarily with cross stitch and uh, hand embroidery. So he utilizes the frame of the embroidery and the surface and um, really translating pixels to stitches. So this is a uh, embroidermation created from a workshop that he hosted with where he had participants participants each do a frame of this cross stitch embroidery of RuPaul, the very famous drag queen. And um, he talks a lot about how shooting and filming the top side of the embroidery and on the on the right there you can see the under underneath side of the embroidery which is very tangled and kind of a little messy. Um, so by shooting, shooting the both top and underside of the embroidery, the faces of the drag queens um, oscillate between the smooth contours of the stitched surface and the tangled raw outlines of the loose threads on the underside of the embroidery. And he likens this to the outside inside animation reflecting the exterior and interior identities of the subject while the threads continue this constant connection between both the top surface and the underside. Here he also really uses, um, I really like that he's used the embroidery hoop as the frame relating to the frame of the animation. And um, lastly here of uh, artists that I've been looking at, Elliot Schultz, who I believe is from Australia. And he use, utilizes uh, the device of the zoetrope to make these um, beautiful embroidered pieces. So at the top, you can see the animation and underneath is a picture of a turntable. So what he does is he plans out his embroidered um, circular frame, puts it on a record player, controls the record player speed to the exact speed that he wants, and then he has a strobe light that flashes. So because the human eye sees about 60 frames a second and animation generally is 24 frames a second or under, it can be 12 frames a second or eight frames a second. When you have the strobe light, it interrupts our vision and it slows down our ability to see frames. It's kind of like slowing down the aperture of your eye. So in that way, even if something is spinning very fast, when you apply a strobing technique to it, it becomes animated. It's a, it's a, it's a trick of the eye. So I really um, find these pre-cinematic ways of animating very, very fascinating. So just to take you through, um, kind of an example of how I work, um, going back and forth between embroidery and animation and drawing. And, you know, I work a lot on digital software programs, but up in the left-hand corner there, you can see that's typically how things start for me. I draw on paper, I do a lot of cutouts um, and collaging to kind of figure out what, what I wanna do, picking out my colors, um, moving over to the top right-hand there. I then scan that image into my embroidery machine software. And that's where I really start to translate pixels to stitches. It, it, revolve, you know, it in, involves quite a lot of computer work on that end to plot out all of the, um, where all of the stitch work is going to go. And then um, moving down to the bottom left-hand corner, that's what the piece will look like on the machine when I have it going. And then finally, the, um, the, the final result, um, one on a jacket. And this is just a very slow down look at what my machine looks like when it's going. It's a 12 head, 12 needle head. Um, the brand is called the Happy Voyager machine. <laughs> And it is a Japanese model. 
so when I first started working with these machines, I was a grad student at Concordia, and this was the only embroidery machine they had when I first started. So it's a six color um, brother machine that could only embroider maybe up to 24 inches across. So if I wanted to do something large, I had to really um, patchwork it together. And I started off just first by translating black and white, these black and white comic kind of um, comic strip drawings I was doing and putting it through the program and translating it directly into stitches. And that's sort of the, the effect that was coming out. So fairly accurate, but not a, it loses quite a bit of detail because a stitch has a definite uh, density compared to um, the line of a drawing or something. So with stitches, you're, it's almost like working with sculpture on a micro scale because you can't make a thread any thinner than it is. In my second year of grad school, I, um, I was hired as a research assistant for Subtela Labs, which was a um, sort of fashion and textiles and technology lab headed by um, Barbara Lane. And I was hired to figure out this machine. So uh, it was a brand new machine. It had just come in from Germany. It's called the Tajima Laying Machine. Uh, so this is on the 11th story of the Concordia building. They actually had to remove the windows from that you can see in the back there and crane the machine up as one singular unit. It was quite a, it was quite a feat. And it arrived and Nobody really knew how to use it. So that was my job for a year was to try and figure out how to make this machine go. Um, it had the ability to lay sequins and um, cording and embroidery. And um, there's quite a, quite a versatile machine. So I started to realize that the programs I was using for animation and the programs I was using for embroidery were also very visually similar. Um, this is what a screen shot looks like in a, the animation program After Effects I use. So it comes to a point where I almost don't even need to look at the actual video. I can tell by these pieces of blocks of layers of videos what's happening based on the timeline so it's kind of like reading a pattern and it starts to feel like you know looking at a, a weaving pattern or something like that so there's all these machine and crafting patterns that started to come up so when i was working for subtella one of the things i was doing was developing um continuous patterns for um, conductive threads so that they could be programmed and have um, lights um, put in to them. So this is a black work design, kind of a traditional old black work design I was working on at the time that's made out of one continuous looping thread um, that can't touch itself, touch like cross, cross wires or else you'd create a short circuit. So from that, I started um, years later, kind of got back into making these repeating patterns again. So an example of that was this uh, hops animation. So on the left, I have the drawings that I started with and the animated movements of the blossoms and the leaves and the vines of the hops plant. And then on uh, the right is all of those little designs put into a repeating pattern. And the pattern on the back of the screen is what that pattern looks like as a repeating yardage of material. So the longer I spend with textiles and the more time I sort of invest researching those processes and histories, the more they tend to influence the kind of animation work that I do. And over the past few years, I have been working at the Glendo, Glenbow Museum, which has given me, um, you know, a monumental 
amount of artifacts that I look at through that job, right? Through through the behind the scenes work. So, um, and a lot of that has been textile related. This is from a behind the scenes tour quilt from a, a couple of years ago. And um, having experience looking at different quilting patterns started to get me interested in how patterns can be animated. Um, from a singular piece. So I started looking at traditional quilt patterns and then trying to think of how they could be redrawn so that when they were turned and rotated in a circle, they would become animated. So the pattern stays the same, but the colors change throughout the pattern, causing it to become an animated piece. So that was the first exploration I did with it. Um, it's based off of the Kansas Trouble uh, quilting pattern. Um, and I really started to get into how quilting has a history of resourcefulness to it and a respect for fabric and um, a practice that has very little waste material. And also that the names of quilts would reflect on the meaning of the fabric and how cherished it was. Um, quilts are used as geometric and geographical landscapes of people, um, their fabric, their clothes, their lives. So this was the very first one that I, I worked on um, to try and get that movement very right. So it's a singular piece that's rotated 90 degrees and then photographed every single time. So it's only four images that are being um, animated over and over again. This is what it looks like when I build these things. <laughs> so it's a combination of machine work, but then a lot of um, handwork as well. I still really enjoy doing handwork. Um, you just, you just can't get the control that you want on a machine, right? Once you put something on a machine, it'll kind of do what it does. And if the tension's off a little bit, it'll sort of warp the fabric. So a lot of times I say only do machine embroidered bits on certain sections of these large pieces. So this is what the finished pro product of um, that storm test looked like. So this is, uh, the only machine embroidered part would be the very central sort of eye of the storm up there, and then the field, uh, the golden field below. So I was starting to think about what other elements I could add into these pieces. And when working in textiles and animation, I always, I always say it's very, resourcefulness is key, right? It's always important to try and Try and save yourself <laughs> some work if you can, um, or or how to you know how to be mindful of things that I make and how can they exist in different in different lives. So I started referencing these figures that I had drawn a few years prior for a calendar series called Prune. It's all about um, they're all ladies in bathtubs, but I uh, translated those into animation uh, sequences but using very simple techniques so this is how this is my light table it's a window in my studio um, so this is how my drawing process kind of looks I have you know layers and cutouts and and uh, until I find exactly what I'm looking for so an example this is animated just created from the image being flipped and stretched um, back and forth on itself. So I worked I worked that into an um, an embroidery uh, done on the machine with kind of these clouds behind the figures for texture. And the the final end result of the animation here. So with this piece, I had to learn a lot about, um, I believe the term is called variable frame rate. 
So in animation, generally, it's 24 frames a second for really high production animation. I generally work at anywhere from 8 to 12 frames a second. But you can't have everything moving at the same speed or else everything just really everything just kind of moves like an insect, like it just kind of shudders at all the same speed. So the foreground, which is the, the wheat fields, is moving much slower than the storm in the background is, just to um, kind of create the, a separation of space between those two sections of the image. So here's another example of a um, very classic quilt pattern that I was looking at. Um, saw a lot of potential in the Texas star uh, quilt design. So generally these are symmetrical designs with the same color being at the center and it kind of variegating out um, to a different color at the ed edges of the star points. But I wanted to see if I could create movement just by flicking those colors out from the center and spinning them out um, to the outside of the star. Sort of the idea of it, it was kind of breaking apart. Um, so again, this is just a image of the quilt on the right and it's being rotated, I don't know, probably 20 degrees every time I take a picture. And then those, I think it's eight, yeah, it would be eight frames that are animating back on itself to give this illusion that it's kind of like a flickering star. Um, a lot of this work came out of uh, a response to materials as well. And I, I always say I never know what I like until I see it. So I. I'm always mindful to respond to my surroundings and uh, to really pay attention to what I'm attracted to. And at that time, I was, I loved working with natural fibers. I had been working a lot with um, wool and silk and uh, these beautiful fabrics that I found in Montreal because that it's quite a textile hub out there. But when I moved back to Calgary, I had a hard time finding fabrics that I wanted to work with. Um, and I started to realize that these uh, pashminas that I was seeing in thrift stores were a way that I could work with, you know, very luxurious fabric, beautifully colored fabric in solid yardage of color. Um, and I could buy them for four or five dollars each. So I started stockpiling all these um, beautiful pieces of fabric. And it's, I really like them because they're, pashminas are, they're a scarf, right? They're designed to be on a body. The colors are designed to be on a body. So in a way I started thinking that these, this color palette was very much about the body. So I wanted to make these landscapes and then have these figures kind of putting the figure back into these landscapes in a material sense. Um, so here's the translation of the, the Texas star pattern, but done in the pashmina materials. Kind of a tricky material to put on a embroidery machine because it's very slippery. And then I finish it by hand on uh, on a table. So that's a studio studio shot of me there. That gives you an idea of how big these pieces are. Um, and working by hand allows me to really control how they fall and how they drape. So there's the final the final piece of this uh, this piece reflect horizon. So another um, another drawing of uh, landscapes that I you know I I go and I collect imagery from the, you know the mountains or the prairies and then try and translate them into patterns. 
And here's a screenshot of what my um, embroidery machine software looks like. So this is one called Embird Studio. It's a, it's a fairly popular software. So this is sort of what my desktop working looks like. So on the right hand side, you can see all of the individual sections of where those embroidery points need to be plotted. And then it's pieced together um, slowly on the machine. My machine only does 27 centimeter square, kind of that's the biggest frame it can, it can handle. So if I'm making pieces that are four by six feet long, um, it takes a very long time to precisely match up those patterns um, by moving the frame over every single time. Um, here's an example of another quilting pattern that I, that I saw. I believe this is just called a water quilt. Uh, and I wanted to see if I could develop this pattern that I could make rippling water effects with. So my, my drawing there is um, a study of diamonds within diamonds um, and then figuring out how to animate those so you know, I could actually create motion, which resulted in this. So again, you can see at the front, at the foreground in the water is moving much, much faster than the shadows and the trees in the background. So it's trying to match what frame rates work. So probably in the foreground of this one, I'm animating at any probably 12 frames a second. And then the trees in the background are probably four frames a second. So depending on how fast you want it to go, you have to pay attention and make sure that those numbers line up with each other. So there's five pieces in this in the Panoramata series, and um, I had the pleasure to be included in a group show at the Alberta Art Gallery called Processor, um, Digital and Analog Retranslations. So it was a group show uh, featuring people who work in various different medias between digital and analog practices. So those could either be I, there was examples of people that worked with virtual reality. There were people who worked with um, um, hacking into uh, old technologies, um, those kinds of things, and and going back and forth between. Um, and sometimes and sometimes translating, and sometimes it being lost in translation. It was a very interesting show to be a part of. Um, so here's a gallery view of when you first walked in there. My pieces were all along the far side of the wall and displayed with a screen that would show the looping animations as well. And these days I'm, uh, I'm getting more into studying simple animation techniques and uh, developing some workshops around these. So this is an example of a workshop that I did at McEwen University with one of their drawing classes. So all of these are um, four, four picture embroideries on a hoop and then designing, helping the students design those images so that when we photographed them and rotated them four times that we could get um, an image that would animate. So with, with looking at these, the way to, the way to see them is to pick one quadrant on the frame and, and watch it. You're not, it doesn't work if you try and watch all four images at the same time, but if you keep your eyes on one section, you can kind of see the animation happen. All while creating it on one singular piece of fabric, which I think is always beneficial for a workshop for students to be able to experience the animation, but also have a tangible um, product at the end of it. Um, so these are just a couple of, of ones that I designed myself. The classic, the classic bounce in the corner there.
So yeah, coming up um, uh, in a couple of weeks at the Esker Foundation, I'll be doing a workshop in, um, the technique is called phenakistoscope, which is similar to this kind of work. It won't be in embroidery, it'll just be in drawing, but it'll be a study, a simple study of animation movements and how to create those movements on a, on a singular frame. Okay, hello again. Aww. Wow, that was amazing, Caitlin. Thank um, you. What a, what a pleasure. Those images are just so mesmerizing. Um, yeah, I could just like watch them endlessly. <laughs> It's um, easier. It's easier to to watch a repeating than to invest in a four or five minute long program, right? I mean, everybody yeah. we spend so much time in front of screens. I mean, that's why animated gifts are so popular, right? Is people can experience them immediately. Mm. The time investment in you know that the, the creating the textile, and then in digitizing and animating it is just like mind-boggling but i'm not going to chat i want to hear uh from the rest of you so please if you have a question uh you're welcome to unmute yourself and speak up uh, or put up your hand or marla is the chat open it chat is. is open you're welcome to uh, to type in your question and um ask away ask away this is your moment i see all your burning questions about embroidermation <laughs> yep <laughs> you've all been laying awake at night thinking about well <laughs> at least one person here <laughs> has been so. yeah mary beth is making a move <laughs> um I, I mean i'm i'm kind of blown away by it all you know seeing how this is all put together but i wanted to ask you uh, more about the content of your work hmm. what are the, the the themes or the ideas that you like to to work with um i'd say for me the biggest subject matter has always been figurative yeah. And whether that's an actual body or a piece of a body or a reference to a material of a body, I think that's um, really where my subject matter comes from. And a lot of times it's not even, it can be nothing more than a gesture that I'm, a, that I'm drawn to. It could be like a, a pose that I see from a you know, a, another figurative work that kind of inspires me to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, I mean, animation and the figure just go together, right? Yeah. So well, and same with textiles, right? It's, they're, they're often in such close relation to the body. So yeah, I would say it's, it definitely stems from figurative, but then also kind of gets into the I use the term like being attracted to natural imagery, but sort of in an unnatural kind of way where I have, you know, a little bit of the grotesque thrown in there, these bodies that are kind of out of bounds or disconnected. Um, and I think animation really lends itself to that because it, you can make it do whatever you want it to do. It doesn't have, there, there's no laws. And so I think, um, I think it's, um, Esther Leslie, uh, who wrote this book called Hollywood Flatlands, where she talks about animation as being this, um, ultimately by its own nature, it's chaotic all the time because it's making something that's, it convinces us that it's alive, even though it's not. And it appears rational to us, even though it's kind of an irrational um, method of making. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, a technical question in the in the chat. Uh, amazing work. Do you use After Effects for most of your post-production? 
I do. I do. I've over the years, I've tried to learn um, various software. Um, I've repeatedly tried to use ToonBoom. I just find that my brain always goes back to Adobe software just because it it all looks the same and it's it's easier for me to do. Even though I know you're not technically supposed to do all of your post production in Adobe After Effects, uh, it would be different if I was making a a short film or anything longer than a few seconds because I don't know if that's like the best program to manage huge file sizes. Um, yeah, so a lot of times I always end up going back to After Effects. Um, years ago, I made um, one of my first 2D animations on Toon Boom. And at that point, you couldn't um, incorporate live or, or like a, a video file into an animation file. It's, it's, yeah, it seemed to be more built for like production, post-production pipeline where there's, you know, you have many different people working on a project and everybody has their own kind of platform that they're using as it goes, goes down towards completion. But if you're just an independent animator, I find it's, it's just easier for me to use one application. So I really like After Effects. It's kind of like, you know, it's like Photoshop for video. Uh, another question in the chat from someone who we know loves technique. Thank you, Paul. Most of the examples you showed use animation or translation. Other animation techniques such as layering, pan, and zoom could be used with your work. Have you explored any of these? Um, originally when I photographed these, um, I call them quilts or, or patchworks that I was doing, I, um, I got really high detailed photographs of them. I took them down to quick draw and I used their, they helped me use their overhead camera and I got all these fine, fine details of the work. Um, and then I had to stitch all those high res images back together to get one super high resolution image that I could work with animating. Um, I had considered it initially trying to add elements of, you know, the, the camera panning in closer on those stitches, which I think would be great because then you'd see more of the detail. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly why I stuck with just the static frame of the image. I think uh, maybe at that point I was, the animations were not, I don't consider them as being the final result of the project. Like I still um, highly enjoy the actual textile works themselves. So I think what I, if I could describe it the way I distract my own self from my work constantly going back and forth between digital and analog and embroidery and animation. Like I, I, um, I tend to go back and forth quite a bit. And then, as you all know, deadlines creep up <laughs> and then suddenly you're at a point where you're like, okay, I think, I think these are both working in a good relationship to each other. Um, if I had one choice over the other, I do, uh, I love to work with my hands. I love to work with materials. So for me, the animation is just, if I can just get it to a point where it makes sense to me and I've got something that I consider to be a, you know, a complete project, then I usually stop there. It would be different if I worked at a, you know, in a, in a, in more technical aspect or in an animation um, design world where, you know, you can keep going with those techniques and add more and more and more elements to them. Good question. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Oh, um, Kenzie, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm happy to hear voices. So just unmute yourself um, or raise your hand. Uh, Kenzie types, I missed the name of the artist you worked with that used conductive thread on that embroidery machine. Can you repeat their name? And yes, Barbara Lane. Oh, Barbara, Barbara Lane. Lane. Um, the studio was called Subtella. And um, I believe she still teaches at Concordia. Yeah, so if you look up Barbara Lane, 
subtella, um, you'll you'll definitely find her. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jessic, go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Michelle. And Caitlin, uh, absolutely stunning presentation at Harcourt House. Uh, that's a really lovely work and it's really you know, very immense nature of the of the uh, of the installation. Um, I had to be in Calgary during your installation. I didn't have a chance to chat, but uh, could you elaborate a little bit more about the uh, significance of the Western style design, Western style embroidery in the works that you're presenting at Harcourt House? Sure, sure. So, I mean, as far as the imagery on those embroidered pieces go, some of them are in direct relation to uh, classic embroidery designs from mm. from um, the that sort of um, rhinestone cowboy era yeah uh, like animals flowers like decorative and then some of them get pretty far into the grotesque nature of it mm -hmm. um, like com combining animals and plants together right. yeah um, and at that time I think I was I was really interested in this sort of fancy Western dress as being used as this kind of romantic idea of Western, the Western identity. And so at that time I was looking a lot into, you know, 19th century romanticism and the ideas behind that. And the reason it was used, embraced so much in Western uh, identity was Romanticism is all about freedom, but anytime you have freedom, I mean, sometimes you could just sum that up as being kind of a escapism mm -hmm, <laughs> from, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from certain things. So it was kind of this pastoral escapism from modern society. And uh, while I was doing uh, research into textiles, I also got into looking more at new romanticism. So a lot of designers coming out of the 80s, like Vivian Westwood and, and you know, um, fashion like that, where it was all about um, fashion being this constant state of becoming. And uh, it wasn't so much about, it was more about if you're in a constant state of becoming, you're always getting ready for something. So. There was a lot of asymmetrical use, um, you know, kind of garish imagery. Again, that kind of using the body as this platform for kind of a grotesque kind of imagery. So I was combining those, the romanticism and the new romanticism coming together to kind of explore this state of how textiles could be transformative. And the, the, the title Dandelions, is it a play of work of the Dandelions or the Dandy as a person who wears or seeks the fashionable Yes, style? yes, Dandyism. I really, um, I, I wanted to um, kind of really emphasize that the people who were wearing these fashions, I mean, it wasn't like everybody was going around wearing mm -hmm. rhinestone cowboy suits. Yeah. Like you really had to be uh invested in your sartorial identity to do that um and you know a lot of times they were used in country western singers to kind of promote how successful they were it was a way it was a way to kind of broadcast that to the world uh which is very similar to um you know dandyism in the 1800s yeah. where it was you know it, suddenly you had society where there weren't sumptuary laws and people could start to wear whatever they could want to wear so you could really elevate your status in society based on the clo the kind of clothes you wore mm -hmm. yeah. yeah thank you thanks i would like to see us all wearing more sequins more bedazzling, please. Here, here. We're all like two more. Here, here. In fact, next Nicola at noon, wear your wear wear your tiaras. Yes. Uh, we have time. At least I'm going to make time for one one more question. Is there is there anybody with something burning? Oh, okay. We have something from Lucy. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, for sharing your process. Amazing work. 
uh, just two weeks ago, I was with a colleague uh, about creating quilt related activity for the RAM, uh, where a particular quilt block could be turned four times to create a larger block. Seeing the animation of your quilt blocks inspires me to push the envelope. We'll go for it, Lindsay. That sounds really exciting. Uh, any last words? Um, I've got a, I've, I've got, got a million <laughs> questions, but I I I know where your studio is, so yes, you know, I'm here them. all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we all are. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining in. You're this makes us a fantastic presentation, and um, Caitlin, what a generous uh, uh, presentation! I will get this cleaned up and posted to our YouTube channel, so you can relive it and share it and thank you and for the rest of you uh, I hope to see you next week for Erin Sutherland um, she will be talking about her uh, uh, curatorial work same time same channel same codes um, thank you all and thanks have so a much everyone wonderful thank you rest of your day okay Caitlin all the best you're awesome <laughs>